Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have a bit of a uh, confession to make to you all, and it might be rather shocking. As you may know, I served in, in the United States Navy Reserve for six years, and my favorite place in the world to be was out to sea, out where you couldn't see any land and you could see every star that God made in heaven. And you'd think that that means that I really like the ocean. Well, the truth is, I'm rather quite terrified of the water. And specifically, what's underneath it. You know, the giant squid that will come out and yank you off the side of the boat and drag you down. And you know, I... I think that's actually partly why I enjoyed the ship so much, because there was always this latent excitement and adrenaline of being out and facing my fear. Now you might ask, though, what does that have to do with Christ hanging on the cross? What's the connection even to our baptism remembrance today? How are these all tied together? Well, if you look at most churches, uh, most Christian churches in the traditional design, and you, and you were to flip it upside down, it actually resembles something of an ark, a ship with its keel running through the ceiling. And that's not entirely accidental because the ship of salvation, the church, has been called the Holy Ark of Christendom. For without the church, without the Christian community, we are left to be carried about by any sort of doctrine or thought or philosophy that comes around, the waves of disbelief that cast to and fro in the world, left at the mercy of every evil that roams the sea. But within this church, within the ark of Christendom, sinners are kept safe safe from the ravages of unbelief. For we have the sure and certain promises of God that we are His dear children. And He is our dear Father. And through Christ, we may with confidence draw near to the throne of grace and that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. And we board this holy ark, this ship of salvation, through baptism. And that is God's appointed means, the appointed means by which he delivers us from the dominion of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. The kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of of sins. What then is baptism? Well, it comes to us from the Greek word baptizo, which really means to wash or to make clean, most often in a, in a ritualistic way. Not necessarily sitting in a bathtub, but a ritualistic cleansing. Water. But it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And as our small catechism declares, it is a washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. And having been justified by His grace, we are made heirs, having the hope of eternal life, this is a trustworthy saying, and so it is. 
But sadly, there are individuals and church bodies that deny the scriptural understanding of baptism. For some, baptism is seen as a covenant, a kind of quid pro quo agreement between you and God. But that isn't grace. That isn't gift. It changes baptism from the free gift of God to a contract, a business arrangement. For others, baptism is seen as, as a personal pledge or a personal commitment and not actually God's own action. But again, that isn't grace. The actor, the one doing something, is not God, but the believer. And it's to the believer's works where his or her confidence is placed. Confidence in the strength of their convictions or in the sincerity of their hearts. Some baptism seen as a way in which God's grace is made available to you, but once you've fallen back into sin, well, then you have to turn to something else, to works, to penance. But what does this make of the promise of God? You see, baptism doesn't cease to be effective with the very next sin. Baptism is and remains forever. It is God's ordinance, not something that we do. But I think probably the, the most dangerous or the most saddening effect of these misunderstandings is that it destroys possibly the greatest thing about God's means of grace, the multiple means of grace, for His grace comes to us by the font, by the sacrament, in the reading of His Word, in the preaching of His Word. And the most wonderful thing about God's means of grace is confidence. Confidence in His action, in His doing. For God says what He means, and He means what He says. This promise is for you and your children. Acts 2.39, speaking about baptism. And Peter says in his first epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, baptism now saves you. God is trustworthy and he is ever faithful. As he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. But what then of those who are not baptized? Well, we should rightly be concerned because Christ has commanded that Christians be baptized. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. But let us not be lost in despair especially for those who have died without baptism. For it's not the absence of baptism that condemns, but the absence of faith, unbelief. That is what condemns. As our Lord says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe, will be condemned. But on the other hand, let us not treat baptism lightly. Let us not take it as something that is optional, a wonderful, nice thing to do, but not, not really required. See, baptism is where God stakes His honor, His power, and His might. And even though it is performed through human hands, 
It is nevertheless truly God's own action. And as our, our large catechism says, baptism is more glorious than anything else God has commanded and ordained because we have not only God's commandment and injunction, but his promise as well. You are baptized, and if you have been baptized, you have the promise that you shall be saved and have eternal life, both in soul and body. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, especially given our reading today, but what about that thief on the cross? Well, he wasn't baptized. But let us recall what St. Paul says about baptism. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The thief was buried with him into a death like his. A cross right next to his. And here's also God's own word to him. Today you will be with me in paradise. And that's exactly what God says to you in the waters of baptism. Today you will be with me in paradise. For you are my dear child and heir of the heavenly kingdom. So let us open our, our hymnals today to page 325. And we will speak together the third part of the small catechism's address on the sacrament of holy baptism. On page 325, on the right-hand side, I ask you, how can water do such great things? And we speak together. Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a life-giving water rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. This is a trustworthy saying indeed. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.